as a leader, whether it's a brand new taco truck or you've got 400 locations as a, as a small business entrepreneur or you're running the business like mine, if you don't take seriously the need to define and live and prove the value of culture within your business, you're missing the most secret ingredient for success. And I would say this, many, many people who run businesses today, this is not their forte. And that's okay, it doesn't have to be. Acknowledge it and hire your gap. Vince, it is really awesome to have you here, but it's a little weird for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, you know, we talk a lot, but very rarely do we sit down and have like a one to one conversation that's like multiple hours long and, and not about, about the, yeah, and not about work. Yeah. Yeah. Or your life. Oh. <laughs> You just had to do that. I mean, it's, it's, you said to be me. So yeah, yeah. No, you, I mean, that's what you should do. I mean, um, as <laughs> yes, you know. So uh, one of the things that's really uh, powerful about you know your story, right, is this idea of how long you've been a part of the Heartland business, and that um, how little of the story prior to being a part of the Heartland business uh, that we get to talk about. And that's one of the things that I want to I want to unpack with you because. I heard you say, um, I don't know, a couple couple weeks ago, you talked about some of the entrepreneurs that we get to meet, uh, you know, being in this role, in these roles, and how thankful you were and are about the lessons you've learned, knowing the other side of being independent entrepreneur versus running a business in a corporate organization. Yeah, you know, I grew up in a family of small business owners. My grandpa owned a uh, produce wholesale business which is back in the day before these big food conglomerates sold all the food to the restaurants. They bought produce from the produce guy, meat from the meat guy. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so we had a produce company that sold to all of the restaurants in St. Louis and we were kind of a big deal back then apparently. Um, I was very young at the time and it went out of business when I was about six or seven, but I have memories of being around that business, being in trucks with my dad, making deliveries, having to go out to check on an alarm that went off at 11 p.m. and you know, sit in the car while he fired an employee and all the things that happen in life when you're running a small business. And when it went out of business, it was acquired um, in bankruptcy by another company that was a competitor in town. And then my, my dad became the leader of that business. And this is back when laptops were like, you know, really heavy and yeah. kind of black and whitish, mm -hmm. right? And Microsoft Excel did like six calculations. Yeah. But I, he would come home and, uh, you know, on occasion when, when he'd be home in the evenings, we would do payroll together. And I'd add up time on punch cards from people in the warehouse and truck drivers and do the overtime math and drop it into the Excel formula. And I mean, those, I was 10, 12 years old, but watching that and, and at the same time witnessing the work ethic of a guy running what was a very small business in comparison to what maybe this business is. Yeah. It's a lot of the same stuff. Wow. It just looks different. That's amazing. Yeah. So you were his buddy. I mean, as best as I could be for a yeah. guy that was a workaholic. You know? Okay. Right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Well, you know, what was kind of like a, the most memorable story when you realized that it's like uh, they were providing for an entire household on a small business? What was kind of like a what was kind of like an early memory of a, of a realization of that? Yeah. So a couple of years before they went out of business, um, this is hard to remember, but there was a time that McDonald's would buy whole potatoes to make French fries. And we had the McDonald's contract for all the McDonald's in the Missouri, Illinois, like uh, Arkansas or, or Iowa, somewhere tri-state area. Yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of cases of potatoes out of our doors every day, every week, whatever. And then it stopped because McDonald's changed the way they did things. They started building their own, you know, facilities to create the French fry and mm -hmm. freeze it and all this stuff. And it was a huge blow. Wow. Um, and I, I don't I don't remember that as specifically as obviously my parents did because I was probably four or five years old. But I remember the feeling in the house around that time. Yeah. Like, how are we going to make it? Mm -hmm. um, but I'll also tell you that in, in that next business that my, my dad went to run, uh, there was a day he came home and you could just tell something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had been laid off and let go from a, a down market in the economy in St. Louis and the food supply place. And he uh, 
he spent three months probably at home looking for a job. And it was just that idea of like, oh, this isn't permanent. Mm. And it sounds crazy, but back then it was normal that like, you know, you'd break a case of milk and so you'd bring a gallon of milk home or let it, you know, lettuce, whatever. So yeah. we, we ate well at home because all the stuff that was left over and almost bad, we'd bring home. Bring home. And for those first three months that he didn't have that job, we were going to the grocery store and buying things I'd never bought in a grocery store before. Really? Which was a weird experience. That is a very weird experience. But it's like you go to the grocery store and you're reminded, oh, my dad doesn't have that job anymore. Yeah. Oh, so it's a constant. Which is reminder. interesting. Wow. That's, uh, I like how you just said that you remember the mood or how it felt at home. That's, uh, that's, that, that had to be tough um, feeling that. But like, you know, I, how did you, the thing that I think is really interesting as well is like a part of your story, right? Like, how did you, number one, how did you kind of become a pilot and then transition to business? How did the pilot thing happen? Well, so being in the restaurant business as a family matter, that's what I did when I turned 15 and got a worker's permit. I was a bus boy, I became a waiter. I worked in several restaurants in town. I was a pizza delivery guy. I mean, I was, I literally had, we counted up one time, somewhere in the 20 somethings jobs between 15 and 19 years old. But like food <clears throat> service. Yeah. Mostly in some sort of service environment. Okay. Um, and uh, I was a flower delivery guy. I mean, you want to talk about weird? You go yeah. from three funerals on a Saturday morning to a wedding on the same day. And like just to feel the weight of the air of yeah. people's emotions dropping off flowers at a funeral and, and then, then going to flowers out. at a wedding. Wow. Um, and so and, and, you know, a new baby being born. So you, you get to be part of these people's lives and these weird experiences. And then you're a server at a restaurant at night and you get these really crabby people who are really upset with you over the wrong kind of tea. Yeah. Because their life clearly sucks that that's something that they're that upset about. <laughs> um, so I was always in some sort of a service business. And when I was in college. Uh, it was a rule in our house. You're going to get a four year degree. That's just what you're going to do. Yeah. And I had four years of scholarship money where it was not as uh, expensive for me to go to school and I needed to graduate. And two years in, I was in the business school. I hated it. I was working way harder than I should to get the grades that were average because I just didn't love what I was learning. Mm -hmm. And the school I was at, the uh, St. Louis University, they had an engineering aviation college and it didn't cost any more to be a pilot. And I thought, I can go fly planes. That's cool. I like speed. I'm <laughs> and so I, I switched schools my sophomore year. I did four years of flying in two years and got the aviation management degree with a business certificate with it. And I uh, thought I'd have a career in aviation because it seemed cool. Yeah. I didn't think about, which is probably part of why I've um, <clears throat> been fortunate enough to have some of the success I've had and the failures I've had. Sometimes I don't think two steps out. Okay. So I didn't think about what the life is like of a pilot. Okay. I finished school in the spring of, of 2001 and I, uh, I had a job that was supposed to start September 15th that year mm -hmm. and the job went away because of 9-11 um, and not I was lot, forced to spend, yeah. yeah, I was forced to spend a month thinking about what I want to do with myself because now I've got this degree that feels kind of useless. Yeah. And uh, I talked to a bunch of pilots who were, you know, near retirement mm -hmm. and their stories of their lives were really difficult to swallow. Yeah, like um, disconnected. Very few still married, multiple marriages, yeah. um, disconnected, gone on on holidays the first 10 years of their kids' lives. And they love what they do, but there was a cost that, yeah. and that's not all pilots, so don't, I don't yeah, want to generalize sure, that. Sure. But it was enough for me to be theme. like, I don't know that I want this for my life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went back to St. Louis and uh, went back to a restaurant okay. and ran a restaurant for a year because that's what I knew. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the story unfolds from there. Yeah. But you have some technical savvy that's, I mean, you know, surprises us, you know, not, 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 I don't know how I should take that. You. I know. <laughs> so I love the ambiguity. Uh, but you have some technical acumen that I think is, uh, is, is really interesting. So how did you go in, into sort of service? And then all of a sudden you show up, you know, uh, the, how did the technical uh, ability kind of show up? Like, yeah. I mean, look, I was, I was always, uh, into like, some version of tech in college i was selling fake ids from my dorm room from a printer that i engineered to take plastic i mean and you can come get me for that if some authority needs to do it it's been a long time but we'll say fake ids yeah i was you know napster was a thing i had a yeah. bunch of songs downloaded and so i just always enjoyed playing with technology i was really into technology uh but after the um the year of running a restaurant i was introduced to somebody who had a small technology company in town uh, that served local businesses, computer systems. And after meeting him, he told me that I should be a salesperson. And I was like, I, I think that's insane. Salespeople are sleazy and horrible and like 
they, they do bad things to other people. Somebody made an impression on you. I had a very bad idea of what a salesperson was. Got it. Okay. Um, and was very unclear about the fact that I might have made a good one. <laughs> um, so uh, he said, hey, you should come work for me and run my sales department. And uh, that was a sales department of zero and okay. then one. <laughs> Built it from the ground up. <laughs> um, so, yeah, hired 10, 12 people, spent about 18 months with the business, realized there was a whole lot of other things going on in the business that weren't really shared with me that I wasn't wow. okay with. Okay. And along the way in that uh, journey, I had, had met and was engaged to, who is now my wife, Nicole, and her brother actually had taken a sales job at Heartland here in Oklahoma City um, right out of college. And he had a degree in like biblical history and was going to be a church pastor. And he was making twenty or $30,000 a month selling payments. And I thought, well, hold on a minute. That's a, that's might a, be a thing. interesting thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I signed up and uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah. I would say uh, ground floor up. So you've done ground floor a couple of times. You know, you... Uh, you went from running sales, being you know uh, employee number one as, in a sales department, to being in uh, largely at the ground floor of Heartland, which eventually you know went public, got acquired, uh, and you've stuck with it, right? You've stuck with this yeah. company. So, like one of the things that's really fun to talk about is uh, a good friend of ours, uh, <clears throat> Wes. He we will not say his last name, but he's a really good friend of ours. And one of the things that he says that he loves most about you, he's worked with you a long time is that you're self-taught, right? All of these sort of things that you know how to do uh, that uh, cause you to run a $3 billion plus dollar company, right? That you're, that you're really largely self-taught. So talk about that. How, how did you go and get some of the business acumen that you have today, right? Where did you dig it up? Who did you get it from? Is it, do you have just a, a sixth sense of observation? What's the, how did you, how are you self-taught as a, as a, as a, the president of a company? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. That's an interesting thing that Wes would share as a perspective. It's, um, it, when I told him we were having this conversation, is exactly what he said. I mean, as you were talking, I was like, I can't wait to hear what Wes said. <laughs> That's not what I thought he was going to say. Yeah. Um, but here's what I tell you. There were uh, worse things said, but we won't say those. So when I was like 12, 23 years old. I was at a family wedding of a friend of, a, of the family. And a guy was there who was my mom's high school friends, like brother or whatever. And he walked up to me and he's like, holy cow, different word, Vince Lombardo. I remember you. Do you remember how you used to just ask me every freaking question that you could think of when we would drive to the orthodontist on Saturday mornings together? And I'm like, is this guy but every month he would take me to the orthodontist because it was 30 minutes away because my mom's buddy from high school gave us free braces blah blah, blah okay blah. i don't remember being that way but when i started to kind of think about that and then ask other people i was this curious kid that just wouldn't stop asking questions well why 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 tell me more about that and if anybody was willing to answer the question i was interested in hearing the answer and I, i've been gifted with a really good memory so i remember these things when i learned them and my curiosity is what I think has helped me be, as Wes would say, a self-taught person mm -hmm. because I'm constantly seeking to understand something that I don't. Yeah. I kind of feel like uh, knowledge is a gift and understanding is, is a deeper one. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to spend time in things to understand them versus just know them. And so once you ask enough questions to learn enough things, you can choose what you want to go deeper into to get a deeper understanding. And I've spent a lot of time in my life doing that. Yeah. And yet I think there's still so much that I don't know that I would like to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that. I would say um, you're really, <clears throat> you really, number one, are a good listener. You ask really great questions. They're super hard sometimes. <laughs> um, but the way you synthesize it's pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty impactful. <clears throat> and I, I would say you're just, yeah, it sounds like, you know, it's just a key part of what, uh, what makes you great is you're a lifelong learner. So, you know, being in the ground floor as, uh, you know, being a salesperson, talk about your, your journey into, you know, um, kind of deeper into the sales organization and how you, a couple of, a couple of some good stories along the way, how you worked your way up. I mean, look, uh, anybody that thinks that a sales job, especially a commission only outbound, no leads, not a lot of support type of sales job is easy, hasn't done it before. Uh, I'd start there. There's a lot of assumptions about how easy this is. I assumed it when my brother-in-law had the job and was earning all this money and had a degree in biblical history. I was like, well, 
I mean, come he on, can do it. I can do it, right? <laughs> and then I spent 90 days and didn't sell a deal. Wow. And um, I uh, I was looking for other jobs. I was convinced this wasn't going to work. Um, and, I, you know, in that next week, a lot of like uh, seeds that I had planted kind of came, came to bear. Um, and then I got hooked because I witnessed the experience of the, the thrill of actually having to put that much effort into say a hundred opportunities to pull out the two. Mm. And that became both annoying and challenging to me. Mm. It was annoying because I felt like there was so much wasted effort and I was going to, I wanted to try to find a better system, mm -hmm. but we were such a young company then that when you got hired, you'd get a six inch binder full of, full of paper to read and a motivational CD to listen to in your car. Cause you know, cars back then had yeah. CD players in them still. Yeah. Um, and, and it was like, Hey, call us if you need us. And the people you'd call were very technical, but they didn't really understand anything about how to sell. And your local leader uh, was supposed to help you out. And mine, mine was great. She was really good, but she did things her way. And I didn't really like a lot of those ways. Yeah. I wanted to try some things out that were different, which was going to cost me money because it was going to take time to fail forward. Mm -hmm. And I would say that within a year or so, I, uh, I realized this had some pretty significant potential for um, long-term earning potential mm -hmm. and a life that had a little bit more opportunity of balance mm -hmm. where I could put energy into things I, I enjoyed, cared about, or loved other than work. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted something I could work as hard as I wanted to at, but if I wanted to hang it up, I could. Yeah. Um, and, and that the role really appealed to me in that way. Yeah. And like who, who was, uh, maybe, um, who, who did somebody like at the company that you're like, okay, I, I need to model it after this person, or this is somebody that is pouring into you. What, what, are, what are some, maybe some coaching moments? What, what, what are some influences along the way? Yeah. Um, honestly, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I had the privilege of serving as a sales professional taught me a lot. Um, not just by the way that they maybe bought, or, or um, ask questions or listen, but you know that that curious part of me. I always wanted to build a deeper relationship with the customer, so I could ask more questions, so I could learn more. And then I was really good at connecting those people to other people in town that they might be able to get help from, or learn from, or partner with, or whatever. Um, so much so that, in fact, there was this. Uh, I was really big in the restaurant business, of course, uh, in, uh, in in the way I sold payments. That's how I made my money because I knew I had contacts, relationships, I knew yeah. the industry, I knew what problems I could solve. Um, and a bunch of these local businesses felt like they were being overrun by corporate restaurants. This is back in the early 2000s when that was kind of a thing. Yeah. And they founded a, um, a thing called the St. Louis Originals, which was a group of, of, of business entrepreneurs uh, that owned restaurants in town that were paying dues to these national and state and other types of associations, but didn't feel like they were getting a lot of local benefit from them. So in, instead of just killing those memberships, they kept them, but they started their own group and they co-marketed and co-branded about, hey, eat eat local. And it was before Eat Local became a thing. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and I got to be part of that conversation and help them navigate those waters and think through that. And we created a special program for them. And, you know, that was a lesson for me of like, hey, there's strength in unity, even with competitors. There's value in listening to and learning from people who do the same thing you do, but maybe differently and maybe even are competing for the same dollar of the consumer's wallet that you are. Wow. I watched that happen. And it, I, I watched people who like kind of had like a, a knowledge, people in the business knew that these two guys hated each other and they actually became like partners in a business five years later because they started this group and they learned a lot and they found a mutual respect. Watching that stuff kind of unfold and, and having a keen eye of the people part of it was really, really educational for me along the way. Mm -hmm. And something that I think would be, um, you know, it'd be a failure of mine not to mention as a learning point. I'd say within the business, there were lots of people that gave me a lot of grace. Um, there were a few times I probably should have been disciplined or terminated or demoted or whatever from mistakes that I made when I decided to be the cowboy that was going to do it my way or whatever. Um, but, I, you know, there's a couple of moments that stick out. Um, one of them was uh, I was in this training and I, uh, I had a very low level of awareness of how others were perceiving me. Mm. Uh, at that stage in our life, we were newly relocated. We had uh, we had two little kids under three years old and I was exhausted and I was just trying to make ends meet for my family and uh, working my tail off. And we were at this training and I was asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the break, the guy pulled me, the, the, the executive vice president or whatever, pulled me aside and he said, uh, hey, uh, we haven't met yet, but I'm, I'm your new boss. I'm your boss's boss. And uh, you just need to shut the F up and listen. I said, what? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm asking questions. He goes, yeah, just stop. 
It's like, okay, it's interesting. Like I thought I was doing the right thing by learning. And I guess I need to stop asking some questions. And it's a weird moment because it's kind of like a rude way to handle something possibly. Yeah, for sure. But what's interesting is that was halfway through the day. And in the second half of the day, I learned more than the first half of the day. Really? Because I wasn't changing the course of what was being taught with all of my questions. I was just receiving the information. Um, and so there's there's value sometimes in just listening. Uh, and that was a, a learning moment for me that I, I've looked back to many, many times in, in my career. Well, that's a positive way to look at a, a really harsh way of dealing with, you know, somebody who's super curious. It's like, hey, uh, you need to turn your curiosity <laughs> off yeah. uh, for just a moment. Yeah. <clears throat> and but I, I do like that. That's a, you know, s somehow you are picked up on the fact, you know, at least in hindsight that you were deviating some of the conversation rather than helping to flow with the design of what needed to get taught. Yeah. 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 Well, <clears throat> And look, there's there's been many people along the way that have poured into me in ways that I would I you know I'm incredibly grateful for. A lot of them are no longer part of the business. They've moved on and done other things, great things with what they learned here and what they did here. Um, and it's not really worth getting into a bunch of names to mention, but I I think I've been richly blessed by people who are willing to go the extra mile to redirect, to course correct, to interrupt, yeah, um, and help me see what I can't see. And and if anything, I think what I've learned along the way is really that, which is. We have to have people around us, no matter what our role is, whether we're opening a business, we're running one, big or small, that help us catch all of the blind spots we have because yeah. we all have them. Yeah. You know, the thing that I, you know, just experience with you and just hearing the way that you're articulating this, I, that when you described the grace, that people had grace for you, uh, I, the, the thing that I think is really powerful is how you have reciprocated that, where, um, you know, somebody who is down a certain path right? The way that you sort of have enough patience and enough grace to go, Hey, uh, here's some feedback on some changes that need to happen. And ultimately the consequences that people would fear for someone being in your position, giving them that type of feedback, the consequences, uh, relational consequences, uh, political con consequences, whatever they don't, they are not at the same weight somehow as you know you know i've experienced in uh, in in sort of prior lives do you think that that is where where do you think that comes from do you feel like you look back at yourself and you have empathy on who you were and how people had grace for you and you're sort of reciprocating reciprocating that and, and moving it forward or what what's sort of a driver there why the consequences are so lower in many cases than the, the grace is abundant yeah um Without getting into all of the details, because they would take a while, even though they're great stories, uh, there were a few times in life that I chose to um, be a participant in something that I probably should have spoken up against. Mm. Um, and it had its own set of consequences each of those times. Um, and I, uh, in, in reflection on those, I think after the third one, they were all in a series of like seven or eight years. And after the third one, I kind of made a, I made, I made two big commitments to myself. Number one, since I'm in a position of leadership and I have the influence over other people's lives, I need to be able to look myself in the mirror when the relationship ends and say, I did everything I possibly could within reason. Mm. Um, because I, I need to make that commitment to myself to honor my own values. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to cut a cord or let a cord get cut or watch someone spiral further into a bad direction because I didn't have the courage to speak up. And then I've got to deal with the consequence of knowing I didn't honor my values, yeah. right? Um, and then the second piece of that, I think that 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 the learning came from was, um, man, if you don't speak up and you know what needs to be said, something else is going to happen that probably shouldn't happen. Mm. And, uh, and so there might be an expense to speaking up. Mm -hmm. There might be a momentary loss of respect until somebody comes around to recognize it's really out of care or some anger or some distance or, you know, stomping away or whatever the things are. Uh, but but I think in this this, this world, if, if we really care about other people, we're, we're kind of called to do the thing that's hardest. And sometimes that means helping them see something they can't, even in a moment where like it's going to take a lot of courage for that moment to happen. Yeah. Well, what is, uh, you know, because I mean, that points to a lot of uh, leadership philosophy. So fast forward, right? You've been in sales, right? Uh, the company, you know, goes public, I think uh at uh, 2005 2005 yeah. and then uh that's a big moment and then talk about you know getting acquired right and what position you were in and what some of the the thinking that you guys 
had at that th those are two big you know two really big moments but like was there a shift when the acquisition you know happened of harland and and how did you participate with that and what were some of the thinking yeah if you go back to going public you know i joined the business in 03 we were public in the fall of 05 i'd been here two and a half years and i felt like i missed the boat i remember the night we went public we were all in, we were all together somewhere and it, it came on on i mean we didn't have you know digital meeting rooms back then but it came out that like 87 people had become millionaires overnight and they were like 65 of them were salespeople. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, I joined I too late. I missed the boat. I, I, the, the, now, now we're screwed. We're public. There's no chance anymore at the big, the big cash. Right. Um, and for me, it was very black and white, which is the wrong way to look at things. But if you go to the acquisition or even the breach, when we had our breach in 2009, which was a huge moment, it was like the biggest data breach in history at the time, right after the Hannaford breach. And it was, hundreds of millions of card numbers stolen off of our network from we were the victim too but nonetheless yeah, yeah. like you know it's not how it looks um and those moments like uh you know like a lot of things in life it feels in the moment like oh my gosh everything i had pictured or thought was this way is actually now this way and you're looking 180 degrees when in reality uh it, it might just be five degrees off and it might be 10 degrees in the other direction and when we when we fail to recognize that there's other ways through, we get stuck in whatever our, as Brene Brown calls it, shitty first draft might be. Yeah. So my shitty first draft was we went public, I'm screwed. Uh, when we got when the breaches happened, oh my gosh, the stock price is going from thirty five to two dollars. And I had, you know, at the time, I don't know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars in stock. So it was worth nothing. Yeah. All intents and purposes. Yep. Um, and uh, and, and I didn't see a way through. And so you have these like moments of all this weight of like, oh my gosh, everything I've been planning on happening just got taken away from me by a quote, no fault of my own. I wasn't involved in, I'm the victim. And that thinking puts you in a place to stay in that bad first draft versus yeah. thinking about how to possibly get out. When the acquisition was announced with, uh, with global payments, a lot of people inside of the business had a very negative perception of what was going to happen. Yeah the business we knew that we all felt what we were part of and this father-like figure that built the company up that we all respected, like what's going to happen now that he's going to go. And instead of seeing uh, possibility and, 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 and perspective, uh, a lot of people just went to like, we're screwed. We need to find a new place to go. Wow. And there were a few of us in a room like, I don't know, maybe there's some things about this that are good, but we had been exposed to some of the things about Heartland that were bad. Mm -hmm. And back in that world of Heartland from 03 to 15, um, you know, it was, it was, it was well put together narratives about what the company was, yep, what the so leaders true. cared about, et cetera. And most people didn't really know what was kind of happening in the business. Yeah. And a few of us, the year before the acquisition, were made aware of that, mm -hmm. which made this much more, I think, of a positive moment. But it was so interesting because in the first two moments of those examples, I sat on the side of the field that was like, this is bad doomsday. Yeah. And the third moment, I wasn't on that side of the field, but I watched hundreds of people I deeply know and care about on that side of the field. Yeah. And to have the perspective of, hold on, it's not as bad as you think, was uh, was a really interesting learning moment for me about, um, I have this thing I tell people all the time that I learned in a, in a positive intelligence uh, seminar thing I went through. Uh, stick the word maybe at the end of all of your sentences that are about things that seem black and white. And all that does is tell your brain, maybe. Oh my gosh, I missed the boat, maybe. Oh my gosh, we got acquired and the world's gonna end, maybe. And maybe forces you to open up possibilities that maybe things will turn out differently than that bad draft has created in your head. Yeah. For some reason, as humans, we typically all go to the bad before we recognize what's possible. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think that's and I do the same thing. I'm not I haven't healed myself of this, but that word maybe has been a very powerful help uh, along the way. Was it easy to put in to install? Once I learned it. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things like, you know, I got a whole list of things I wish they would have taught you in college. Yeah. Instead of the things they taught you in college. What's one other than the maybe? <laughs> um, that uh, when good people make a bad decision, it doesn't make them bad people. Dag. Uh, that is so true. What's another one? Yeah, you, I'm, I'm just going to keep asking. <laughs> it's just like three gold nuggets in 20 seconds. I think another one is uh, you, you, uh, you, can, you can work yourself like literally to death and make less progress than if you find a way to balance what it is you spend your energy and time on. And that's this cheesy like work-life balance thing. But the truth of the matter is we all think that putting in more and doing more and having more actually generates more. And and the reality is there's so many examples out there that business schools should be teaching that contraction and reducing yeah. and focusing 
in so many parts of your life will actually produce a more fruitful and positive existence for all of us. And the maybe would help there, right? Huge. Yeah, that helps helps a, a lot of the decision making uh, because if you have the right mindset, the maybe helps you shape the mindset. And if you can do that, you can see the angles. Yes. Yeah, that's really good. You know, a couple minutes ago, you were talking about uh, <clears throat> living in your values. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about uh, what living in your values means as it relates specifically to like your leadership philosophy? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I appreciate the question. And I think the answer about living into your values is kind of the same in other parts of your life too. Okay. Um, first of all, I think that I, I <laughs> another thing that should have been taught at college, figure out what you care about, um, which I didn't really do until about five years ago. Um, and I would tell you that uh, once you understand what you care about, you're forced to understand what you care about less. And I didn't say what you don't care about. So yeah. I'll give you the example. You go through this list of 300 values and there's lots of exercises online and different tools that do this. Brene's book, uh, Dare to Lead, is a great tool for it. Um, there's a couple other books out there as well. But uh, they have these lists of values, 100, 200, 300 values. And you start by reducing down to, let's just say, the 10 that you probably think you care about. Then you got to get down to like two or three, which means you got to get rid of seven things. And by scratching them out, you're kind of like, I don't care about that. Right. Mm. Um, I have a very deep faith. I care a lot about family. Those are not two of my top three values. And I had to like admit to myself after a lot of thought and reflection, For sure. holy cow, how is this less important than something else? But if I'm being honest with myself and what drives my behaviors, my thinking, my action, my motivation, my decisions, it's not that is true. It's not faith and family above other values. So I think that process in and of itself is a very, um, it, it's a it's a rich blessing on anybody's life to get more connected to the person that you are. Mm -hmm. I also think you probably have to do this multiple times over life because I think we change a little bit over time. I think when I was I 25, so. my values were probably right. a little bit different. Um, but my, my three values are authenticity, contribution, and leadership. Um, and in all parts of my life, the first one's pretty simple, which is like, I, I don't really enjoy people who are incapable of being authentic, whether in business or in my personal life. I think life's too short. We have too many demands on our time. We have too many things we wanna do and to spend time with people who aren't willing to get real with you and won't let you get real with them for a guy like me doesn't feel good. So I avoid relationships that people can't get real in. Yeah. Um, Contribution to me matters way more than I realized uh, until I had teenagers and just have to question what exactly they're contributing to anything. Mm. Um, and uh, and what I would say about that is uh, I have this uh, really strong bend towards like we are here to make other people's lives around us and the world around us a better place. And so we are all called to contribute with whatever those gifts are that we've been given that we should be contributing to to the people in the world around us. And when people are not contributing, I get really, really frustrated. Yeah, um, I, it's it's like this baseline expectation of a one on one relationship, of a group project, of where we spend our time and energy. We should be in contribution and service to others. Um, and, you know, what an amazing world if we were all thinking about how to serve others all the time. I'd have hundreds of people serving me and I'd be serving hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, and leadership is something that's really near and dear to my heart because Leadership, when you break it down, is nothing more than influence. And influence is something that we all have the power to possess on ourselves and on other people. From as something as simple as the way we send a text message, we influence someone's thinking, or the clothes that we buy, or the things we talk about, or all the social media, like it influences everywhere. And people don't associate that with leadership, but the truth is if you are able to influence how someone else thinks, acts, or behaves, you're leading them. That moves in all directions. It's not a it's not a single direction. It's not like a, a down thing where if you're above someone on an org chart or you're their parent or you're their elder or their senior or above them in whatever volunteer. It, it is literally all around you in 360 degrees. And uh, to, to not recognize the power of influence and respect the value that influence holds, good or bad. Uh, those three examples I, I didn't share the deep stories of in those 10 years of my life when I learned a lot about the power of not speaking up, my lack of voice was influence on people. And had I spoken up, I would have had a different type of influence on them. And um, so I feel like we are all called to lead in all parts of our life. Um, and so when I think about what that means in business, that means tough conversations up, down, and around. 
uh, where you bring your authentic self and you require others to bring their authentic selves. And we don't hide behind some some fake wall or some shadow we've created. And we're going to get real because if we don't get real, we can't fix the problem. Uh, and that means things might get messy er before they get better, right? They're already messy, but sometimes you have to be okay with things getting a little bit worse before they get better. And you have to hold on to the maybe that they're going to get better uh, if you're going to choose to step into those kinds of tough conversations. So in work, I think that's sometimes... I don't want to say unwelcomed because I think in our business it's it's become a norm, but I think uh, outside of our business it's a very unusual thing for people to experience. I, I think you're right. Um, you know, I experienced how unusual it is, and it, it, I, I think uh, something that's really interesting about what you're talking about is this is a uh, um, uh, this is in the fabric of the culture. So, like, if you're in leadership, you are helping to either modify or redesign ex an existing culture. And I, I, the sort of value centric thing shows up uh, pretty regularly in this culture. So like maybe just share a little bit about uh, intentionally building culture and how you use values and building teams and, and your own personal values to, to shape and reshape cultures. First of all, I didn't, this isn't something that, uh, that I like dreamt up or built, Like this has been written about for a long time by people way smarter than me. And I've had the blessing of some leaders who really cared a lot about culture. Um, and I, I had the blessing of witnessing leaders who profess to care about culture and didn't act in accordance with the culture they profess to care about. You saw them outside of you, one of your values, which is authenticity. Yeah, absolutely. There was an inauthentic connection point there of, wait a minute, we say these things, but I'm watching these things. What What's going on there, right? Um, and, and then you have a choice in that example in alignment with my values, speak up and influence or don't and influence, but they're both influencing. Uh, and and I, I think what I've what I've learned is when you have a, a culture defined and you have a set of expectations of what it means to operate within that culture and you yourself are required to do the same and held accountable to do the same, um, there's nowhere to hide and there's no reason to hide uh, because you, you have this, I don't want to call it a rule book or a playbook, but there's an understanding of what is expected and why, why it's good and produces fruit. And if you don't have that, people don't know what's okay and what's not as an operating mode. Mm. And so then you have this, you know, in any business, let's just take a 20 employee company without those cultural definitions. You have 20 people who come from 20 different lives of experience and influence. And most recently their last jobs that all had different cultures, trying to find out how they do the thing you're asking them to do. And so as a leader, whether it's a brand new taco truck, or you've got 400 locations as a, as a small business entrepreneur, or you're running the business like mine, if you don't take seriously the need to define and live and prove the value of culture within your business, you're missing the most secret ingredient for success. And I would say this, many, many people who run businesses today, this is not their forte. And that's okay. It doesn't have to be. Acknowledge it and hire your gap. We all have the gap. And if you don't have the the natural gift of of defining and living cultural values within a business, or it sounds like hogwash to you, I would tell anybody who hears this, take my advice and pay somebody to come into your business full time that does that well and can help extrapolate what you want and watch what happens in the first couple of years because it'll transform any business. So what it sounds like you're saying is uh, culture especially designed culture uh, and, and authentic culture is a competitive advantage. Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, but it's kind of funny. I don't even think of that uh, when, when, when we're engaged in these conversations and we're trying to, uh, you know, build and, and continue to strengthen our culture as a business across, you know, all of these different operating, um, you know, models and states and people and roles. Uh, it's naturally a competitive advantage. And I wouldn't even put that on the table because yeah. I, I think that is just something that becomes a side benefit because the truth of the matter is having that culture allows your people to live better lives. And when people are living better lives as employees and teammates of your business, they're running a better business. And of course that's a competitive advantage. Yeah. But I don't walk around and think now, how can our culture become a competitive advantage to these three competitors? Because I kind of don't want to spend time thinking about that. Mm -hmm. I want to make our culture as rich and beautiful and productive as it can be for the people that are here and let the rest take care of itself. Yeah. But the, one of the things that you're really calling out is that culture has to have a belief system. 
Yes. It's like it's a common sort of core belief. And it has to be held by the people in the most senior roles and embodied by them. What is a challenge and maybe a, a lesson or a secret that you learned where you were like, how do we get to the root of what we should believe or what we do believe and bring that to life in and through culture? It's a tough question. Yeah. From experience, I would say that when you're trying to improve or change cultural operating norms within a business is where that question shows up most mm -hmm. because there's people coming at it from different historical perspectives and life experiences. And um, I think giving space and time to wrestle those out with the people in the room who have done the most listening and understanding and uh, are the most involved in defining and leading through the culture, but creating space for that conversation to happen and not considering it um, as a loss of productive business time is is a really important step that is really hard for someone like me to do. Uh, because the five hours we spend deciding what we're going to do with this cultural thing is five hours that I'm thinking we could have been talking about how to advance our products and move down the field, et cetera. And I care about and love culture as much as anybody I've ever met in a job like this. And yet I still get annoyed by that. And it's necessary. So um, I think that there's this thing, uh, we talk a lot about uh, rumbling respectfully here. And uh, again, stolen from Brene's book, Dare to Lead, and what it means and what the rules are around how to challenge another person's behavior or thinking um, in a way that is respectful and appropriate and aligned to get to a, de a better outcome. And it allows you to come at, it from, come at a problem from two different perspectives and experiences. And you don't have to agree at the end, but you have to align and hearing each other out using this, this tool set or the system of rumbling respectfully. It's a big part of our culture here and not enough people do that and step into it like they should. And I would tell you that when they do, beautiful things come out of it. And we typically get to the answer when there's a conflict about culture uh, and what we should do with culture if we go through the process of rumbling with the right people in the room. What are the risks that people uh, sort of feel like they face when they know that they need to have a tough conversation? You were talking about having influence and you're either influencing by saying something or saying nothing. What what do you think goes, what are some of the things you've seen or heard or maybe go through your mind when you know you need to have a conversation like that? Yeah, well, I think it's probably an important thing to note that um, if you were to take that uh, that tip and you were to apply it kind of wholeheartedly across your life without any kind of uh, awareness of the moment or the people involved, it would be a big mistake and I would call it reckless. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's not just about like, I'm gonna make sure I'm exerting the right influence in the right places. It's also like at the right time and recognizing that for different reasons, it might not be the moment to have the conversation and ensuring that, uh, that, that in fact, maybe you can create that moment uh, in order to have the conversation, which requires more intention and more desire to have the conversation in the first place. But I, I, I feel like one of the things that, uh, that people use as an excuse not to is because uh, whatever damage they're worried about might come from this is greater than the damage they can't measure that might be happening in the background. So let's say you've got this employee and this thing's going on and it's not going well, <clears throat> but they're kind of a single point of failure or they're responsible for this really important thing that's going on, but there's just this um, wasteland around them of people mm -hmm. and experiences and just bad interactions that are happening. It's really hard to measure the impact of that behavior. It's easy to measure that if I just let Susie keep doing what she's doing, I'm gonna get to the finish line of this project and I won't have to delay the project. And, and what we don't often do is consider what the cost is because tangible costs are much easier to us to recognize. That, I just lost $10, that's obvious. Not being able to measure the cost, but knowing it's big is, uh, is really, really hard. And so we oftentimes go where uh, an objective outcome leads our brain, like tangible cost, and or the expense of making the decision, but the expense of not having that conversation with Susie and the people around uh, around Susie that are interacting and losing to, to her experience and her leadership and falling over because of it, that is something that as a leader, you, you have to be aware of and acknowledge and have the courage to step into. So choosing the right moment to have the conversation, but not, not allowing the behavior to perpetuate um, for an outcome that is more objective or productive for the business. 
Yeah. That, that's a gutsy thing to do. It really is. And, you know, Susie thinks that, you know, in this case that she knows what's best, right? She believes her outcome is the right outcome. And you've got this wasteland of people, right? And, and projects in the wake. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about one, you know, a way that I, I've seen you lead, right, is it comes from observation, curiosity, and experience to recognize the wasteland, right? Because I will tell you, it, Susie, and an environment where people are comfortable sharing that they feel the way Susie's making them feel. So example. true, so true. So those, you know, you don't you don't have to pay that price by having that person there if you have the right people and you got the experience to lead through it. Yeah, and it still might cost you a month on your project. You know, Let, let's go simpler and let's just say um, you've got five locations of a restaurant and one of your managers, they're just not the right fit. And there's stuff happening around them. There's not there's not leakage. There's not theft. There's not that kind of severe stuff happening. Yeah, there's just moral stuff. There's a cultural ethical. there's a cultural issue. They're churning employees. The 20 year bartender who everybody comes to sit with has finally quit because she just can't take this manager anymore. And you are going to have to run the store for two months while you find the replacement. OK, well, what are your options? Right. Um, <clears throat> you can wait to have that last conversation, knowing that manager needs to go. Uh, you've already had the confrontations. And you can, the intangible cost is all of the employees that they're impacting, all the patrons who aren't having a good experience because the employees aren't happy, they're not producing good food, they're not serving good food. And we all know how sensitive food is. You have two bad experiences, you're not going back. It's true. The cost to your business to sit on that leader is extreme and yet mostly not known in exact dollars. Mm -hmm. um, hard to quantify. Hard to quantify. You could take that exact example to any business, to any model, when you have someone in a position of power who is not operating the way that your cultural norms would require them to operate. Mm -hmm. And it takes guts to choose culture over productivity. And it's really hard. Well, something that I, I think is really powerful. Um, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk about the, the, you know, really we call it the Heartland way. And when you, uh, one of the things you just talked about was made, as a leader, especially if you're leading a business, even as an entrepreneur, it's your responsibility, right, to create the space to unearth what you believe and to shape it, right? So ultimately, uh, a big thing for us was uh, this, you know, value system of uh, the, the Heartland way. I'd love for you to just talk about that, how it was born. Um, and and how how you're sort of using it today is something that's a manifested, very articulate, well articulated way of shaping culture. Yeah, well, I I could tell you I don't I don't know that it's as well articulated as people might think because I think it's still got too much meat on the bone. We've got to slim it down. But at the end of the day, uh, this is about defining your culture. You can have your mission statement, you can have your credo, you can have this like the vision of where you're going. But if you don't give your people the key on how to operate within the map of your business with people, with relationships, by defining your culture very clearly and readily for them and exemplifying it in the way you lead and reinforcing it regularly with real life interactions and experiences, it's not going to take root and change the business for the positive. Mm -hmm. And what we learned along the way by trial and error and lots of failing forward is if we talk about something once every couple of months or we stand on a stage in an annual event and we're rah rah this thing that is part of our, supposed to be part of our culture, and maybe we're doing our best to live it out, but we're not regularly <clears throat> using it to better the business, to clarify, to define, to create examples out of, it's not gonna stick. And <clears throat> when I took over the business, there were a lot of questions that people had like, hey, we hear these things, but we don't really know how to live them out in our role. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the behavior looks like to to be an entrepreneur who respectfully serves an entrepreneur. We need we need more than that credo to help us. And so we went out on a, on a little journey and we spent three or four months listening a whole lot, talking to a lot of people to understand kind of how they would define things, what they would what they would refer to them as. We read a lot of books, we hired a couple of consultants <clears throat> and we drew a map out and we had like 16 or 18 things that we thought were, uh, we call them tenets now because we had to come up with the right word about what they are, but um, modes of operating, expectations, things in the business that, that define how we're going to operate within the business. We cut it down to 10 and organized some things around them. We created these podcasts and released all this information and these articles and these examples. But that was just the introduction. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned along the way is if I stop talking about it and if the senior team stops talking about it, 
It just becomes another thing that people occasionally refer back to. Yeah, it's cat posters and eagle posters on the wall. And and we did a really good job for like a year, really in reinforcing this. And and then we kind of were like 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 all leaders, like, hey, we told them they got it. Let's move on to the next thing. Check. And we've learned in the last uh, several months that this is not something that is as deeply rooted in the business as it needs to be, and it needs to be talked about more. And I, what I have found is the most opportune times to talk about it is when there is an example that is somewhat public of, of a team or a person or a project or a process that is not honoring the culture. And if you define your culture correctly, everything that happens in your business that needs correction can point back to that cultural definition. Mm. And almost everything good that comes from your business can point back to that cultural definition. So you have this like thing to lean on of, uh, of, of how we're gonna treat people, work together, operate and, and perform that allows you to always go back to it. And I, what I would challenge business leaders to consider who might listen to this, if you've put the pretty words on the poster or on the website about your values, but you don't reinforce them, you don't require people as a standard to to honor them within the business. You don't use real life examples to celebrate when they show up really well yeah. and to call out when they're missing. Then they're nothing more than pretty words on a page. Cat and that is, that is on us at the top of the business first mm -hmm. to embody and change that. Uh, well said, you know, I, I, one of the things that I think about a lot is, you know, your, your values, um, should shape how you pick people and your mission should help how you help show you how you pick deals or customers. And one of the things that uh, I, I would say uh, has is really interesting um, about because I, I look at the tenants as a tool set, right? Because the values are embedded in there. The mission is embedded in there. And and those are um, I'd say those are subtext, if you will. But go back to the Susie example. Um, you can't have the feedback conversation without the definition. Correct. Right. And or it just feels like you're speaking another language. Or, or it's a preference thing. They yeah. just don't like me or whatever. So the intention there has a lot to do with it. And that's one of, one of the things that I do think we should talk about is one of the tenets is clear expectations and accountability. And this is something that you hammer in a, and I'd say a super thoughtful uh, way. And I, I, I love how you frame up why expectations matter. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if I've actually framed it up this way for you, uh, but I've simplified this recently to try to make it more approachable and really understandable. I don't even know where I picked this up. It was in a book or a podcast somewhere. Sorry, I can't credit the original thought leader here. <laughs> Happiness, I think in life in general, equals reality minus expectations. And uh, forget about work and culture at work for just a minute. Just think about your life and where you're at, how you're feeling, your level of joy, happiness, satisfaction, et cetera. And if you go to the last time you felt elated and the last time you felt the opposite, like miserable, it is most often because you've created an expectation of that moment, that situation, that story, that experience that didn't meet reality mm. for a number of reasons, maybe because you had a really bad idea of what that was going to be and and you were just off maybe because a bunch of crap happened that threw it off right yeah. it's the simplest uh here's here's a great example of this in real life so we go on these we take our best people our, our top sales performers on these incentive trips every year the last couple of years it's been post covid summer travel insanity in the united states flights canceled chaos all the stuff everybody's experienced in summer travel and um, in years previous, whenever a person on our team who are supposed to be people who honor these values and whatever, whenever whenever their trip would get messed up by something outside of their control, we would have an earful. It'd be this whole thing and they'd all expect everybody to jump to their aid and fix the problems, et cetera. We sent an email the week before the trip and reminded people about, about what it means to give grace and to have patience and to set your expectations that there's going to be problems your luggage might get lost. Yeah. You might end up a day behind where you're trying to go. You might end up stuck next to the bathroom, the back of the airplane next to somebody who smells, whatever, right? If you set that expectation and it happens, you're okay with it because yeah. you've prepared yourself for it. In the last two trips, we've had zero complaints and we've had like 10 times the number of issues. And I'm not gonna say it's just because we sent an email, but the reminder of like, oh yeah, I should probably not expect this to go perfectly. It's a big deal. 
Um, and so what, what we've what we've learned is when we can manage our own expectations, and that doesn't mean always expecting things to suck either, just to yeah, be clear. True. But when we can manage our own expectations, we usually can, can live lives that feel a lot more at peace or full of joy and less frustration and stress and anxiety and discord and all those sorts of things. And um, and and I think that in having expectations of ourselves and of others and communicating those to ourselves and to others, uh, we put ourselves in a position to be able to measure whether or not that's happening. And that's where accountability comes into play. Because it's one thing to say, I'm gonna expect this of you or I expect this of myself. But if I haven't told you that, I can't hold you accountable to it. Yeah. If you haven't agreed to it, I can't hold you accountable to it. And if I haven't told others what I expect of myself, it's real hard for me with my bias and, and lack of awareness and blind spots to see when maybe I'm not actually performing to those expectations. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of value in accountability. And I think that looks like a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And I don't think it needs to be prescribed. I do think we all have a better chance at a more filling life if we have managed expectations and people and ourselves to hold us accountable to those expectations. I, that's amazing. And I think that's a big part of leadership. You have somebody there uh, who expects that, creates space for it, and and can set the expectation of themselves and of the team and hold themselves accountable. And that way, leading that way should create accountability, you know, the permissions, if you will, or the credits to be able to hold others accountable. Yeah. And, and interesting how that shows up when we first put all this together and kind of put pen to paper on it and tried to create a program out of it. We were thinking about more of the, the individual contributor level in the business and they need to have clear expectations so they know whether they're performing or not because they deserve to have that. Uh, and accountability to that performance. What, we, what we've what we learned since is, it is 10 times more valuable and important to make it clear that you have a minimum operating expectation of your leader that they set clear expectations with their employees mm -hmm. so they can hold them accountable. We had a problem for a while in some departments that they were doing all this accountability holding, but there weren't clear expectations <laughs> or the expectations were changing every two weeks. That's not a healthy environment for anyone to operate in as a professional. And so as a business, it takes just as much effort to make sure your leaders know what it looks like to set expectations and hold accountability as it does to create a tenant that gives you permission to do so. Yeah. Well, you talked about rumbling uh, respectfully, which I think is uh, is uh, uh, more art than science in many ways. I think uh, one of that would be really helpful to talk about is just this this idea of 360 leadership and that being, you know, uh, expected right of our culture is that if you're squarely everybody's got a boss right and uh you know especially if you're a uh a, a people leader you know you have people that report to you and then you have peers so i think it'd be really helpful for you to just how do you think about um 360 leadership as it relates to sort of the professional work environment and 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 how you've sort of sh shaped that tenant for us well um you know let's go back to <clears throat> um Let's go back to this idea that leadership is influence. Um, we have, we are all leaders in, in all parts of our life, but we are leaders by name in some part of our life, whether it be at our household or in a, you know, a, a group at church or at school or, um, or at work or with friends. There's, uh, you know, there's, there's every person in the world is expected to lead somewhere. And we all have the power to do it by being someone who recognizes the responsibility of having influence. Once you have that as like a core understanding, you can't look yourself in the mirror and be honest and say, I'm only going to have tough conversations with people who are below me on the food chain. Mm. Um, because that would be, uh, you know, uh, what I would call a cognitive dissonance to the agreement or alignment that you have influence ability in all directions. It is my responsibility to speak up and influence above me, around me, diagonally from me in life and at work and below me uh, without a whole lot of permissionable regard for following an org chart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to describe this with a visual that's like you've got layers of people in an org chart and in most traditional companies, politics requires you go up, over and down to have a conversation. Uh, at Heartland, like that's the kind of thing that will get you fired almost like that's ridiculous. That takes so much time and bureaucracy. Just go talk to the person, have a conversation. Productivity matters enough that we don't need to worry about the politics and the bureaucracy. And if you're choosing to lead in the way of going up and around, you're choosing to ignore a direct opportunity to influence another person for a better outcome wow. and to seek to understand their perspective in the process. 
So when we think about 360 leadership uh, at the business specifically, we, we ask all of our people to recognize the responsibility that they have by being a member of our culture with this as one of our tenants and what that influence comes with the responsibility of and recognizing that we're gonna respectfully communicate with people, we're gonna follow those cultural guidelines, but we're not gonna allow kind of predetermined rules to associate who we influence and who we don't. Oh, that's really good. And when I think about my best people, the individuals in our organization who have the most, um, uh, I don't know, they think the biggest and they create the most change, they're the ones who aren't, aren't worried about my title or your title when they have a conversation. Mm -hmm. They're just talking. They're explaining what they're seeing. They're sharing their perspective. Yeah. And they're recognizing this is how they can influence up. And when I see the people struggling the most to achieve what they set out to achieve, it's usually because they either aren't trying or they aren't recognizing that the ways they're trying aren't working in influencing around and above them. Mm. We get so much more capacity of our own output if we influence around and above than if we influence below. And yet cultural norms require us to think leading is only something you get with a title to push ideas and thought down. Wow, that's powerful. And I, I think, you know, you're going on three years leading this business. The tenants of the Heartland Way show up. And then you have this other side that I'd say is a really great Venn diagram of these leadership competencies coming in where you want to challenge the leadership uh, that's maybe over and above, you know, or or adjacent to however you want to describe the Heartland way is for everybody. And then you got these leadership competencies and it was like, was well, that really for just leaders? And it's like it actually really is for everybody. Yeah. Right. Because so you're, we're those. all leaders. Yeah. Um, yeah, the leadership competencies are interesting. You know, um, my wife would tell you I'm way better at acknowledging gaps than than um, complimenting people's abilities. <laughs> um, and she's right about that. And that's both a gift and a curse. But when we looked around the business and with the competent with the, uh, the the Heartland Way tenants kind of released and communicated, we started to see that there was this other layer of um, what we needed our leaders to become. And if you take any group of 10 leaders and you, you, you put them on a measuring stick, they're all going to have gaps in some areas. We all do. I've got a, I've got plenty of them. And so we started to look and study and understand what a lot of the brightest minds in history have said about what good leaders look like from a competency perspective. That is the ability to, to do or behave or act in a certain way in accordance with somebody who has responsibility and leadership. And we realized along the way it applies to everybody because we all have responsibility and leadership. Um, and so those competencies are meant to be not like a report card against which you judge yourself. I mean, they can be. I think people have used that, that way over time, but more a map on, um, look, if you want to be a really, a really well-rounded leader who influences well, these are the areas that you probably need to aim or seek out competency. Um, and to, you know, it's funny, but sometimes you don't realize how you're feeling until you put a word to it. Sometimes you don't realize what gap you have until you put a word to it, and then you can go research and learn about that. So when we when we created these competencies, we didn't just come up with a concept. We put articles and videos and lessons and and classes people can take and books they can read and 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 tests they can take about the, the level of competency, the, so they can go self improve in areas that they feel like or have been made aware that they have gaps in their leadership abilities, which again is all of us. Yeah. And, you know, the thing that I, is very clear talking through this, uh, and hopefully it's clear to everybody listening, um, it is a significant investment to define the culture, to define how you think about leadership, to uh, build the content around it, to share it, to make it a part of the fabric of how uh, all conversations sort of happen. And then the thing that I think is really interesting is if you think about those leadership competencies, it's a, it, there's almost an expectation that if we're all going to be, you know, we really are leaders at s somewhere in our life in this pursuit of self-improvement. The thing that I think is really interesting is the level of investment that you and the company have put out to be able to design this is, is maybe a reflection of how people should personally invest in themselves and the type of outcomes that are available to them if they do that. And I know that you do a lot of personal development and leadership development. So talk about that and how you've made that kind of a core part of your life. <laughs> it's so interesting. I have met so many people who have multiple postgraduate degrees and still haven't figured out 
what they want to do, what they care about, how to make the living they want to make, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I liken that not because anybody who gets a postgraduate degree is bad, like go for it. Heck yeah. There's so many good things in that that are really big blessings. And it's a perfect example of you sign up to receive development. You receive it the way that institution is going to give it to you and you hope it's going to better you. Mm. When in reality, if you think about kind of that, that, that modern educational thought, which is here's the prescribed package of information you need to digest for us to certify you as whatever we're going to certify you as the level of, of digestion, understanding and ability of each individual largely relates to their own abilities, experiences and backgrounds and desires. That's true. And you think about that compared to someone who says, you know what, I want to get better in X and I'm going to go seek getting better in X. Um, and what we require and talk a lot about in our business is we will give you the map, but we are not going to sit you down in the classroom and teach you the material. Um, and, and, and we will coach to a certain standard and we will help develop your, your gaps and your competencies to a certain standard, but at the pace and, and method which you choose to go after it. So to anyone, who, who might hear this, I, I, my advice that I learned a long time ago is if you keep asking other people to make you better, you're probably not going to get better. Mm. Because if you're not serious about doing a lot of the work on your own, it's not going to have the same value. There's a reason why you you hear about these, uh, these you know, top of their field people still having coaches like a Tom Brady, right? And I don't mean, a, I mean, a, like a life coach type person. And those people typically exist to help call you out in the areas where your gaps exist. They don't exist to give you the solution to the gap. Um, and, and that's the beauty of, of really good coaches. Their job is to ask tough questions to identify opportunities. It is not to solve the problem. The powerful coaches, they make you aware of a problem you need to solve. And then they create a path for you to solve it yourself. And, um, you know, you can go back to the West comment of like the self-taught thing. I think uh, I think that that's funny. I've never labeled myself as that or heard that said about me. Um, but I was the guy the first seven or eight years I was here that was like, you need to make me better. You need to invest in me. I want this. I want that. And I woke up one day and realized no one's going to do it for me. I just need to go figure it out. And there's lots of really good people with lots of good material. There's great books. There's good lessons. And if I take seriously me getting better, uh, with the right resources and support around me, I'll actually get better. And I think that's something that we all probably need to be a little more serious about. And I'd say it's okay if you're in a season where you just don't want to work on yourself right yeah. now. Yeah. Because it's exhausting. Yeah. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> Constantly challenging yourself everywhere. You know, I wanted, I wanted, uh, I want to talk about lessons and conclusions, like things that you've uh, learned along the way, right? So um, think about, you know, yourself working, you know, going from uh, employee zero as the head of sales of, you know, a computer technology company. And and what what are some of the things like what would be the first thing that you would say back to that Vince? Knowing well, what you know question. now. Yeah. The best things take time. Uh, you know, you think you can do it all uh, really fast and you probably can't do any of it to the degree of success that you think you can if you try to do it all really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say the most powerful one, though, um, I'd say I learned this five or six years ago from a um, dear friend and coach in our life here at Heartland. She uh, she she learns that the power of words on uh, she teaches that the power of words on our own thinking is way more extreme than we realize. And, you know, she talks a lot about the words but and 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 uh, and how we use them oftentimes incorrectly. Uh, you know, but is a statement that kind of takes the second part of what you're going to say and deletes the first and and allows both to exist. Mm. Um, how was your weekend? It was really good, but I'm tired. It was really good and I'm tired. I mean, that's a stupid every Monday conversation at yeah. the water cooler, right? And yet it changes the context of the entire thought and the experience the person's having. It's so, so true. When you take that into human relationships and the psychology of human relationships and you pull but out unless you actually mean to use the word but, it changes a lot about the possibility and potential of what can happen when two people are trying to work on themselves and each other. Um, and I would say Vince 20 years ago lived in a much more black and white objective world where um, and wasn't really a word uh, that was used a lot in that context. And I think it's an incredibly powerful word. 
Um, I would have taught myself the the equation about happiness because I don't think I managed my expectations really well the first, I'd say my 20s, my first 10 years of my marriage uh, and and my, my professional life. Um, and I would, uh, I'd also say like, man, like make time for fun. It's probably good advice for myself at this point too. Like mm -hmm. we, we, we are so serious about accomplishing in progress in progress and results that we, we fail to recognize that when you look back at the last 12 months of your life at any given moment about what moments had the most joy, they were probably the most unexpected, the least planned with people you care about the most in a, in a place or a moment where there was very little stress. Yeah. Uh, and that's not normally while you're working to produce results. Yeah. I think that thing that keeps us going as people is we want more of that. And we've taught ourselves that if we just keep doing the thing, producing the next thing, building the next deal, then that more of that will happen. Mm -hmm. But if you don't stop and just shut it off every once in a while mm -hmm. to let that happen, you usually can't even recognize it when it's happening. And I, I wish I would have taken more time back then to just not be so serious about getting the next thing done. Yeah. You know, the couple of things you've said uh, just in this conversation that have been um, really powerful. You've used the word and the word but and the word maybe <laughs> i mean and, and that, that simplicity right really matters and and the the thing that i like about what you said a couple of seconds ago about the the word but is you said hey when you're gonna you know say uh even the weekend thing i had a great weekend but i'm tired and you talk about how it really deletes that first thing and it almost makes the good weekend not worthwhile yeah yeah it's it, the thing that I think is really interesting about that is like um, something that's really helped me is this idea of there's right and there's wrong. And that's a that's almost like a there's a one thing can exist, not the second maybe helps both things exist and helps both things exist. And the world that I think that uh, instead of living in a world of right and wrong, I've, I've decided to live in a world of what's wise and what's foolish. It's a great way to say it. Right. And I think it's really powerful the way that you've kind of shaped the words and the and the using of the word uh, and maybe in place of but unless you actually are going to use the word but and and the, and the way that you've you've uh, used the word maybe having both of those exist, I think, is um, probably a transformational, probably transformed the way that you think and the way that you kind of look at the light at, at your life. And how would you you know, these lessons that we were just talking about, about, you know, the, uh, you talking to a, a, a younger Vince, Vince, who started building teams. Okay. You're early, you're building teams. What, what would be sort of like a lesson that you've learned along the way about early team building and, and some things that you wished you would double down on or, or, uh, maybe chosen an alternative path. Um, I think defining kind of the, the mode of operating the rules, the, the cultural components of any team is the most important thing to do out the gate because it does set a level of expectation of how you're going to operate. Um, and without it, I think you leave a lot of room for misunderstanding and tension to exist and tension just completely um, removes possibility for success because it's just constant anxiety and frustration and negativity. And it's really hard to want to stay in that environment. Um, so I'd say that first and foremost. Secondly, I'd say, uh, man, everybody's got something they're really good at. And uh, don't put them in a box. I think we oftentimes label people by title or experience or by results. And we're like, well, they're only capable of that one thing because whatever filter we've put on our view of them or whatever the, whatever the label is we've placed only lets us see that as their possibility and potential. And uh, man, I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell you how many hundreds of times I've seen somebody that we thought was really bad at this thing over here. And when we, when we sought to understand their real capabilities and possibility, we moved them over to a different responsibility and they just, they, I mean, they, they just set records, you know? Um, and I think that seeking to understand those people on your team and their, where they're good and letting them use those strengths while you're developing the gaps, uh, allows a team to move much farther, much faster. Um, and I'd say that the, the most important thing I'd say of all of it, though, I, would have to be uh, give your people permission to to push back, change the way you think, lead you, speak, speak back to you respectfully, both directions, but speak back to you, call you out when you're full of crap. Mm. Because, man, 
nothing's worse than somebody who's in a position of given power and puts themselves in an isolated tower to not be made aware of how they are operating and helping or are not helping other people feel the way they deserve to feel about their work and their output and, and their life. And unfortunately, in many cases, those leaders, only people who have the experience close enough to really call them out are the ones they have not given permission to call them out. Wow, that's a mistake. And we have to be able as leaders to let the people closest to us, even if they're quote, below us in an org, uh, to let the people closest to us to say, hey man, I'm gonna check you on that. That's not what we need to be doing. Or what did you mean when you said that? Cause it felt like this, right? Um, and it takes a lot of courage for people to do that. But if you give permission in an environment, it takes less courage and you'll get more of it and you'll get better faster and you'll go farther. Yeah, but you have two things, right? You, you create space for that stuff, but you also have a big personality, right? <laughs> Sure. So if you think like one of the things that I think is really powerful about that is every leader has their own sort of dynamic. So you just talked about the ivory tower leader who's really disconnected. You're super connected, but you also are really passionate. So how do you think some of the people have been able to in, in your life um, and, and in your work life have been able to sort of speak, speak into you? And what, what are some of the moments of courage or the moments of speaking up that have really made an impact on you? I think it's really important for people to remember that that people in positions of leadership um, are also human and, you know, they put their pants on one leg at a time and um, they have issues and they have struggles and they have personal stuff going on in their life, just like all of us do. And to aggrandize those leaders to the degree that you forget those things are real makes them less approachable in your own mind and and less real. And therefore, you have more fear in bringing things up. And so I think it's really important for us as leaders to acknowledge that we get kind of dehumanized in that way by the nature of the job. And because of that, if we want to invite more feedback and pushback, we need to be more human. We need to show that human side more. We need to be more honest and vulnerable about what we're, what's going on in our life and you know what things we're struggling with and what things we wish we were better at and all that sort of stuff. Because the more people feel like you are, quote unquote, as normal as them, the more the more, the less courage it's going to take them, the more often to speak up when you need to hear something. I think that's, I think that's really important for us to, to, to take away from conversations like this uh, and remember those things because it's really easy to forget that. Uh, I think I can tell you that uh, I've only had a couple of instances where people who hadn't had the chance to know me as a human mm -hmm. still had the courage to speak up and share and I'd like to say that every time that happens, I respond in a way that invites more sharing, but I'm also human and sometimes I'm not so in the true. mood to hear that. And I think in those moments, we've got to go back and we've got to tie that string. Um, there's this old psychology lesson about relationships are about strings being tied and strings being broken. And when you do something that offends or hurts or, or damages the other person in the relationship, you're breaking strings. And when you're doing something that's life-giving and fulfilling and trust is being built and experiences are being had, you're tying those strings. And the more strings there are, the tighter the relationship, the stronger it is and the more it can handle some of the tough stuff until that last string breaks and the relationship breaks, right? And so you, you think about a moment where somebody who doesn't know you as the human version of you, they only know you as the boss version. They have the courage to say the thing and you respond in a way that isn't in accordance with your values, the cultural operating norms and yeah. the tenets. If you don't circle back and say, hey man, on me, not okay. I should have handled it that way. It was not about you. Here's what was going on. You, you immediately said, and by the way, oftentimes you need to do that publicly because you immediately set a tone. It's not okay to, to bring something to me unless you're close to me. And sometimes the worst thing in an ivory tower leader is one who has a bunch of people around him and only listens to those people and they all think like him. We have to surround ourselves with people who think differently than us and challenge us and have the courage to do so. And I've been blessed with, with people coming into my life, both at work and personally, who aren't like me, but like me. And meaning they, they enjoy me as a person and I enjoy them as a person. And so we have enough mutual interests and, and likeness to stay in a relationship, but we think and approach things from very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that forces me to either galvanize my beliefs and feelings about a topic or be changed to a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And those are really good, healthy things to be happening in our lives. And the problem is, Chris, all of that stuff I just talked about, it takes a lot of time because connecting with people takes time. And time's the thing most precious to all of us. 
and where we choose to spend it um, has certain fruitful outcomes or not. And and I think that uh, if I can impart any kind of wisdom on 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 the younger version of me, keep taking time when you feel like you don't have it even to pour into the connection points, to be more human, to have more connection, to get more feedback, to find and become the best version of you to help other people. And that's that's this this formula that's really, really hard because there's all these things on life that are that are pulling on us as as people. But if we can if we can pause and remember that this moment of connecting is more important than whatever might be going on, it's gonna help all of us be better. That's such a good statement, man. Well said. Well said. Well, um, I, it's it's a it's really been uh, powerful to hear a lot of things from you that um, you've been able to maybe unpack in a different way, right? And the and and maybe more of a one on one intimate conversation than you know some of the stuff that you, we do as groups, right? So um, I have some rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Okay. And uh, these are these, these are the ones you wouldn't show me. These are the ones I wouldn't show you. Yeah, I was like, no prep. You Does rapid fire mean I have to have a rapid answer? Or 100%. Just, okay. I'm going to just rattle right. them off and you got to go and, you know, um, I know that some of them won't happen. There's a couple of them that are going to require a longer answer, so don't feel too constrained. But anyway, so the first question. So you're a notorious DIYer, okay, around the house. And uh, what's the home improvement project that you're most proud of? <laughs> <laughs> and notorious is a good word. Um I built a shed. I mean, it's more than a shed. It looks like a little guest house, but it houses a bunch of crap. Um, and I was really proud because it was the only thing I ever constructed from complete scratch. And then the first time it rained, I realized I built it as a low point of elevation and it gets wet whenever it rains. So so you're proud of it. I'm proud of it. Feedback and I yourself. have feedback for myself. <laughs> Great. I want to tear it down and rebuild it, but it's like. <laughs> Can I really do that if that was the thing I'm so proud of? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, it's, uh, you know, ornate and flooded. Got it. Yeah. Well, uh, I know you're no stranger to the barbecue smoker. What's the secret to nailing a good brisket? Oh, the same thing as secret to good relationships. It's time. Okay. Unfortunately. Yeah. And brisket's not my thing because I've only done a few of them. But it's way easier than people make it out to be if you uh, if you just are willing to let someone else tell you how on a YouTube video or on a website. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, when it comes to food, what's your kryptonite? Um, man, I'm a big pizza and burgers and salad guy. Oh, okay. kind of mainstream American, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. Pizza. Well, you know, I don't eat the French. In there, so yeah. Pizza. Yeah. Uh, okay. As a pilot, have you given yourself a call sign? If, <laughs> <laughs> if not, what would be a call sign for oh, Vince? Oh man, Lombardo? no, but I totally should. And, uh, man, I don't know what I would. I don't know what I would name myself. I more think like, what would the air traffic controllers name me? Um, and it's probably loud. <laughs> <laughs> loud guy 73. I have this like weird anxiety when I'm flying. They're like, if I'm not really, because all these people mumble on these radios and like, if I'm not clear, I'm going to die. Yeah. So I'm kind of slow and clear and loud. Yeah. And it's very obvious when they come back <laughs> that I just, they're like, like surprised to them. Listen, loud guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you mentioned them earlier, but I do think it's worth saying it again. What are your three core values? Yeah. Authenticity, contribution, and leadership. Yeah, that's good. What would teammates say is your biggest weakness and biggest strength? Hmm. Um, are we talking there like- There is a right answer. Like currently? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Yes. Um, I'd say my biggest weakness is uh, consistency in where and how I show up. Um, I'd say I've become a bit of a swoop and pooper, which if a people corporate don't seagull, know, you know, yeah, you know, you, you pop in, you're like, that's what's broken. And then you leave. Um, and so uh, I need to work on that. And uh, but being more consistent in how I show up so that the expectations that we mutually create uh, are honored. OK, well, and your strength. I mean, I feel like we've talked about it a lot, but um, just being real. I think that uh, I think there's so much more power to being real than people realize. Yeah, I'd say connection, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is your best advice for somebody coming out of college and thinking entrepreneur, corporate or entrepreneur? Um, I would like to talk to them in high school because I would have told them to spend the couple years of high school and four years of college where they're working to try on a lot of different jobs because there's nothing that can paint 
your feeling about what you want to do like experience. Um, we have this really cool entrepreneur program here and we just wrapped it up last week and hearing how many of the entrepreneurs came in with this like really clear textbook plan to either validate or devalidate what they want to do in their life. Almost like, almost like once they make the decision, they can't go back, which is kind of funny, but we all thought that we were 22 too. Right. Um, and, uh, and a few of them were like, I took this job because I was sure that I wasn't going to want to do this in my career. And I just needed to be really sure. It's like, what you spent three months doing something you hate yeah. just to prove that you hate it. Well, I don't understand, but there's a, there's a trial and error about that, that I think is pretty impressive. Um, my advice to those people though, is, um, before you decide to abandon the thing you've decided that you don't like, make sure you've given it all the angles of trying that you can. I think we've become a culture, especially our younger people. Um, I don't want to call it like a, a wasteful culture, but one where it's easy just to like back out of the thing and go try something else. And um, I think it's really important for people to recognize that when things are hard, it doesn't mean they're bad. I think a lot of our young people back out of something because it gets hard. Um, and you know, jobs, jobs, they're called work for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like the, most people don't feel like they are never at work. Even people are like, Oh, it doesn't feel like work to me. Yeah. My ass. Some days it probably feels like work mm -hmm. and, and, and it will, and it's okay for things to be hard. It doesn't mean that they need to be, they need to be removed from your life and you hit the eject button and sticking with something. Sometimes that's hard has so much more value to you as an individual pursuing the best version of yourself then exiting stage right to the next thing. That's not a requirement to stay in a really bad, toxic role or, or, or business, but hard's okay. Mm -hmm. I like that. What, uh, you know, one of the things that's great, uh, especially about uh, one of the buildings, one of the Heartland buildings is every conference room is named after an entrepreneur. And uh, there's a bunch of these things. What uh, entrepreneur inspires you and why? Oh, man. Um. So it's funny, some of the names when we had the contest to name the entrepreneurs, I got, we got the list back and I was like, that's not an entrepreneur. Why is that person on the list? And it's like, wait a minute. Okay. I, yeah. I'm being a little bit too limited in my, in my thoughts. So I would say that uh, Olive Ann Beach is probably someone that I'm most impressed with. Uh, and that's not to take away from a lot of other entrepreneurs, but to be a, a woman in the 50s, and step into a leadership role of an aviation manufacturing company when there's only like four in the general aviation space and to build it into the insane powerhouse that Beechcraft is today is a pretty unbelievable story. Mm -hmm. I mean, aviation in and of itself is not, has not traditionally been a female friendly environment. Um, and I'd say in the last 20 years, that's like started to change. But if I were a woman in aviation, I would still feel like I'm in a man's field. Mm -hmm. Not, not fairly either. I just would. To do it in the 50s and like stay in business. I mean, I imagine a world where she literally wasn't getting business because she was a woman. Um, and 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 yet still like one of the most successful aviation companies in the history of, of the world, which it's is pretty powerful. cool. It's powerful. Uh well, it was really great to be able to sit and go deep on a couple of these, uh, a couple of these topics. Of course, it's a privilege to sit and do that with you. Appreciate you taking the time. What's uh what's next for Vince Lombardo? Uh, I mean, more of this. <laughs> you mean like today? Lots more um, of this. Lots more talking. Yeah, no, I um, I don't have some like uh, really prescribed plan. I kind of feel like uh, there when, when the right thing that's next shows itself, I'm gonna go do it. And right now, I think what's next is I really want to prove the value of continuing to enforce culture in a huge organization and what it can do while we continue to try to become this preeminent technology player in the business that, that we know we have really, really great resources and tools in. And, and to do that with people who are happy and healthy versions of themselves and really enjoy being part of it, it's so much more exciting than just achieving some summit at some point in time. And, uh, and so I'm heads down in that. And I think that's, uh, I'm okay not having some plan. It's good. Well, thanks for coming to the studio. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it.